you don't want to be shot if you go in a bar, and you don't want to be shot if you drive in your car down the street. These are things that's happening now every day. But the, it's happening by people that is carrying illegal. I just want to thank everybody for coming out this evening. Uh, Mr. Jackson and I have had uh, a, couple of, a couple of spirited conversations about the issue of the hour, which is Conceal and Carry. Uh, it is a bill that has been um, up for consideration in Springfield. Uh, it did come to the board last year, and I voted in the affirmative. I voted for Conceal and Carry. It was an issue that um, I really pondered over a lot. And I really looked for a lot of information and a lot of data because I didn't want to make um, an emotional decision about something that was um, going to affect so many citizens. And I try to do that with every issue. I try not to be overly emotional about an issue. And I try to look for the data and look for the facts. And uh, Mr. McDonald was someone who I spoke with um, maybe a couple of weeks before we took that vote. And, you know, I think we'll probably get into some of those questions about, you know, what does the data say, uh, so on and so forth. But I thought that it was, it was important for me to have the opportunity to talk to you. We did take a vote on this about 14 months ago. But obviously in the wake of the Trayvon Martin situation, a lot of emotions have riled up in a lot of people. And they have uh, viewed Conceal and Carry as the Trayvon Martin issue. And they're absolutely two separate issues. Um, but Mr. Jackson and I have had a number of conversations and I said, you know what, I, th I said, I think it would be a good opportunity to have someone like Mr. McDonald, um, who's sitting, who sits here to my right, come and talk to our community. And I don't know how much you know about Mr. McDonald, but uh, Mr. Otis McDonald fought the city of Chicago all the way to the Supreme Court and won on June 10th, excuse me, June 28, 2010. Um, he'll have an opportunity to address uh, to address the crowd about that issue in greater detail, but also with Mr. McDonald this evening is his nephew. His nephew, Frederick Jones, also happens to be a law, a law professor at Louisiana College, and Frederick goes um, and talks with groups such as this with Mr. McDonald. So with no further ado, I would like for all of us to give our gracious attention to Mr. Otis McDonald. It come a time when my neighborhood got really bad. My house was broken into five different times. My garage was broken into twice. The gangbangers and drug dealers decided to start taking it out on me personally because I was calling the police on them. So they, going down the street one night, they stopped my truck, middle of the street. They, you know, they made me stop because I wasn't going to run over them. These was kids that played basketball in my backyard. They had grew up now. They threatened my life with everything, every name that you could imagine. I had to sit there. Now, knowing these kids from four or five years old growing up had done so much with them, to them, for them. You know, you have to imagine really, really hard to get close to what went through me to have to do, to sit there and listen to that. It was not very good feeling. I was sorry for them. I hated it. I didn't, I just didn't know what to do. I knew I wasn't afraid, but you know, it, it, it was a thing where, what can I do to help? So I, start thinking about the neighborhood and the people, my wife, my family. And so I say, okay, I'm doing, I'm doing all I can, going to CAP meeting every first Thursday of the month. The policemen's in the areas doing all that they can, most of them. 
is not working. The mayor was passing laws every month or so that was victimizing me more than the, than the criminals were. Because on one side, they was passing these laws saying that you can't have your rights that you inherited. And a long time ago, back in 80-something, they had put a law on in Chicago that people turn in their handguns from their homes so that they wouldn't have anything in their house. He was vulnerable then. And I said, okay, all right, got to try to find some way. I don't have the money to get a law suit going. I've got to find somebody with the power and the money and resources to uh, do something about this. So I went to Springfield on a little letter that had came from Illinois Rifle Association to most of the neighbors in, the, in Chicago, come down for a rally in uh, um, 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 Springfield. I'm not knowing anybody in Springfield, so I go down, meet a lot of people, exchange a lot of ideas, and then the following year I went down, I'm going to try and cut this short now. The following year I was down and met with uh, the director of the Illinois Rifle Association. He said, I hear, I hear you've got a lot of problems. I said, yeah, I'm being threatened. My life is being threatened. My house has been bro broken into numerous times. And so he said, okay, say, how would you like to meet somebody <coughs> from Virginia that would, wants to file a lawsuit? but you are required to do a little something that may put you out there. Okay, let, let, let me meet these people. From that we met. I met with the uh, lead attorney that was from uh, Virginia, the uh, um, Second Amendment Foundation. That was who financed the venture. We talked for a short time. The other three co who become my co-plaintiffs later, they were getting ready to walk out. And I asked the guy, I asked Alan Gore, I say, Alan, do you have the resources and the power and the intentions on going all the way to the Supreme Court with this case? He say, that's where we intend to go. I say, I'm your man. I am your man. I will. I will put in for a handgun, knowing that it's going to be rejected, but they needed that. We needed that in order to file the charges. So that was putting my family on the line and myself. But I stepped out there. I had no fear. There were so many people in the city, so many people in the state that's being victimized by gun laws that only apply to the law-abiding citizens. How can that be right? It can't be right. Now, this, in my neighborhood, I'm going to uh, cut, cut down and then I can ask a question. But uh, in my neighborhood, the street that I, a year, over a year, a little over a year ago, couldn't walk down at night. I couldn't set up in my house and listen to the TV because of windows vibrating. The whole walls actually are vibrating. And I couldn't go out there and say anything to them. Call the police. They settled down, you know, doing it just as quiet, just like decent citizens in, in the streets and things. Police come down the street, going on. As soon as they get to the end of the block, then they're gone again. That's what I've been dealing with. So June 28, we went to Supreme Court, all through the courts in Illinois and to the Supreme Court. June 28, 2010, the Supreme Court said, Otis, you're right. They didn't say, Otis, you're right, but they say the case was wrong. 140 years ago, there was immunity clause attached to the Second Amendment writing. It was wrong then and it was wrong 
June 28th of 2010, but it, after that, he said, it will be no more. He then said, the law in Chicago that says you cannot have a gun in your home for self-protection, that is wrong, but it will be no more. These are the things that I accomplished because I stepped out. I had no idea where I was going to get help, who I was going to turn to. I had certainly didn't have any idea the amount of people that it was going to affect. But in a positive way, I thank the Lord for guiding me. And now I want to introduce and let him say some words to you in the law forms because I'm not a lawyer. You know, I just finished high school, college, and stuff like that, but <laughs> I'm not a lawyer. So uh, later I can answer any questions. And again, thank you so much for being here. And and uh, I'm proud of my uncle. I mean, I'm just proud of my uncle and my aunt. It took a lot of intestinal fortitude to take the stand that he's taken. But before I get into the legalese, I just want to thank you, Mr. Jackson, for having us here and having been able to have this discussion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Representative Gordon, I have nine sisters. And one thing I know about a black woman, that is, they some strong women. And black women know how to make us men look good. And I think that's what you've done on this particular issue in more ways than one. And the more I dig into the history of the 14th Amendment, 13th Amendment, 15th Amendment, all the way back to Dred Scott. And when I drive down the streets of Louisiana, I still feel the blood screaming from the streets that was paid for us to be here. I better keep my professor hat on <laughs> and talk to you about the law. Let me see now. Let's get me get started and I'll be very brief. Uh, I've always learned to bring you B speech. Be brief, be sincere, and be seated. <laughs> Chicago had a ban against homeowners owning a handgun for over 28 years. McDonald wanted a handgun in his home. So he applied for a handgun and was rejected. The case went all the way to the Supreme Court and was heard in February of 2010. I was there. I got admitted to the Supreme Court bar on the day that case was heard. In June of 28, 2010, the decision came down that the Second Amendment is a fundamental right to all American citizens and is incorporated into the 14th Amendment through the Bill of Rights. And that is the part that's so critical for me, a non-gun owner, somebody who, I'm not really interested in guns but I'm interested in the Constitution and all the rights that come with the package of the Bill of Rights. And to cherry pick out one or two and don't incorporate them all is to deprive and go against everything that Douglas, Nat Turner, and many of the abolitionists fought for. Because one of the things that they all said from what I've read is the definition of a slave is one who can't defend themselves. And uh, 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 this right was given. And as, I, as I've studied the case and, and looked back, I went all the way back to Dred Scott. And then the, uh, there's two cases that I'll, I'll put out here that are very, very critical in this journey. And that is the Slaughterhouse case. That was a Louisiana case. And then the Cruikshank case. That was a Louisiana case relating to Colfax. The Supreme Court butchered both of those cases and almost every legal scholar that you talk to will say that the Supreme Court got those two cases wrong and those two cases was the same law that the Seventh Circuit was rejecting McDonald's case on until it got to the Supreme Court and when I saw that Louisiana connection and how, how, how this was all going together it really caused me to get excited and uh, to see how the the Bill of Rights being incorporated through the 14th Amendment and, uh, and so forth, and the whole target was to put us all on, equal, on an equal playing field. 
and to give us our full rights of citizenship because that was the big issue from Dred Scott where they said he was not in a citizen and that people of, of, of blacks would never be citizens and then you come on down to all these other cases where the 14th amendment was passed to correct Dred Scott and give us our rights and then after the 14th amendment was passed then the Supreme Court pretty much took all the strength from that amendment by making bad decisions on a couple of key cases that stood for a lot of years. And during that time, you all, we all know that the Civil War took place and what, over 600,000 people died during the Civil War? So a lot, of, a lot of lives was fought that we might have the right to defend ourselves and to protect ourselves. So uh, 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 that's part of why I'm here and why I'm excited and why I will <coughs> take every opportunity I can to just uh, share our story and the struggle, because I believe that the Second Amendment rights is part of our civil rights. Um, when you say concealed weapons, okay, that means that um, you, you keep your, you can have your weapon on you, well what about? No, no, no. Okay. In your home. In the home, but what about if you're out and about? Does that also include you taking it with you out and about? What, what, con <laughs> what concealed and carry? Um, some of the proposals that, that have been brought forth at General Assembly would allow, for the most part, in every other community in the state of Illinois outside of the city of Chicago, you can already own a gun in your own home, um, given the fact that you have a firearm identification card and that sort of thing, you know, your gun is registered and you're a uh, legal citizen, you don't have felonies, you can, you know, you can own a gun, excuse me, own a gun in your own home now. But what the concealing carry law would do is it would allow you to have your gun on you when you leave the house. That's specifically what that would do. That, that was the question. You were talking about homeowners of having a gun, which we've already had that right here in, in, in Peoria. But we, are we talking about concealment and carry? Because that's where right. the difficulty comes in. I see us as losers in the concealment and carry. Uh, but the, legis right. the legislating, the legislation that they're considering, right, is the as you say, the concealed carry. Concealed carry. Outside, do you want to speak yes. to that, John? Sure. And my my concern is, you out on the highway or in the city, and for that instance, police stop you. You think if we had concealed carry, the police won't be out of their car with this gun on a black man uh, opening the door or something? I would not have answered the question. Have you uh, served in the service at any time? No, other than our ROTC. Oh, okay. All right. Um, yeah. um, most, you know, you would think that, you know, police officers, you might, some might think that police officers would be um, not in favor uh, and, and not have uh, this particular position. They, they wouldn't want concealment carry because, you know, they are folks that would be pulling people over on a very regular basis and having to walk up on cars and pull people over and not have any idea, you know, whether or not they would uh, be happy, so to speak. And quite honestly, police officers across across the state are in favor of the law because they're very clear that people who they pull over have guns already. Right. But it's typically people that are not law-abiding citizens like but us. That's but they, they're in this Beginning, they were told the police officers, and now they're and, and now, now they're they're, they're yeah. absolutely in favor of the legislation. Yeah. But the other piece that I'd like to add um, is the fact that in 49 other states, everywhere except for Illinois, right. there is some form of concealing carry. Now, Arizona and Alaska and Vermont, they absolutely have the most liberal form of concealing carry, where you need, where you, if you're born, you know, you can have a gun, you can have a gun in your in your stroller. But in every other state, in every other state in the union, they have some form of conceal and carry. Contrary to popular belief, uh, you, you've had some folks who have said, oh, we need conceal and carry, it's gonna make violence, you know, it's gonna drive violence down. And the data, data shows that that isn't the case. Violence doesn't just decrease because you have conceal and carry. But on the flip side is the truth as well. Violence doesn't, uh, Having concealing carry does not turn our community into the wild, wild west either. Things, for the most part, stay the same. Folks who don't have a desire to have guns, don't carry guns. 
people that love guns, they have them now, they're going to have them then. And the guys who are carrying them now, they're going to continue to carry the ones that are carrying them illegally. So for me, um, the issue had to simply be based on the facts. And the fact of the matter is, is that right now, law-abiding citizens are the, really the only ones that are not carrying. And so that's why I decided to um, make my decision to allow law-abiding citizens, because if it doesn't change anything, then why not allow a law-abiding citizen to have the opportunity to uh, express their Second Amendment right? What are some of the exceptions? And I asked about where you take a gun. And I asked that because the last thing I want is people in bars to have guns, drinking and, and you know. The other, and, and, and my, and one of the real concerns I have also is, is police officers stop people and ask for information, you go to reach for something and the police shoot you and you don't have a gun but that life is gone. You know, it, it, there's so many, so many things that, that happen when you have some, something that people know that's concealed. One place we know guns show up in abundance and that is in bars. As a matter of fact, you know, uh, whether le legitimate or Ill illegitimately. But I think there are uh, post offices, certain governmental places you can't have them, certain parks yeah, you can't have them. Uh, uh, so there are some limitations where by, uh, I'm School. not, schools, you have the various school zones, are some of the places that you can't have them. And the other, and the other thing that I, I would quickly add, I'm going to cut you off, but the other thing that I'd quickly add is that there's no law in place right now, so in terms of um, crafting what would be doesn't it, it, it doesn't it, it doesn't exist as of yet. And I will only speak to the fact to the uh, um, the sympathetic side of it, and that is that you really um, have to think about this here in this way, and that is that at least look at it anyway. Um, you know, you don't want to be blew down, blown down by somebody in your car. You don't want to be shot if you go in a bar, and you don't want to be shot if you drive in your car down the street. These are things that's happening now every day. But the, it's happening by people that is carrying illegal. The only thing I can say to all of you is think about the fact that the playing field needs evening, and then that we will hope and pray, or we will pray and hope that it will be a deterrent. People have a, a human being have a funny thing about when they think that the other pe person is equal to them. When they get ready to attack them or something. They won't attack, it's easy. And, and most of the criminals are cowards anyway. And if they know that you have the right, you don't have to have something, if they know that you've got the right to have something, then that puts something on their mind when they think about robbing you or killing you. Uh, I would like to, I would like to uh, address you about the uh, policemen. I have talked to many policemen. I know many policemen in Chicago. Now, this, you know, this may or may not be the facts, but they come to me and they tell me, they say, Mr. McDonald, thank you for what you have done for the country and for the people. We wish that we could stand with you publicly, but there's another, there's another fact to that. I won't get into that, but they are respective of the actions that the Supreme Court has done. They say, we, and of course you should know, that policemen are not paid. Their duty is not to protect you as a citizen. The citizen has a right to protect themselves under the constitutional rights. But I thought in the case that you had that uh, Judge Scalia said that the Second Amendment does not provide citizens with the right to carry a gun anywhere, any place, at any time. 
I think those words are specifically in that decision, the McDonald decision. If not, they're in the, uh, what is this? No, that's 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 the Heller's decision out of D.C. Yeah, out of D.C. So, right. so in essence, he was saying that the Second Amendment does not cover concealed carry. Uh, is, is, am I right or wrong? Okay. You're right on the verbiage and that specific language saying that the Second Amendment does not give citizens the right to carry a gun anywhere, anytime, in any way. Just as the First Amendment does not give someone to say anything, anytime, anywhere, in any way. So, just as the First Amendment has to have parameters around it, so does the Second Amendment. And that is what must be hammered out by the states across the country regarding McDonnell. It's established that it's a fundamental right to have the Second Amendment, the right to self-defense. In your house. In your house. Right. In your, well, 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 well. We had that before McDonnell. Right, okay, okay, yes. Well, yes, yes, but in your house, and the limitations of the McDonald decision goes beyond your house. The, 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 the basis of McDonnell and the parameters of McDonnell has got to be ha hammered out throughout the states. And that's what what's the, all the litigation is going on about now. If they got a felon, if they got a felon, they're not going to be able to get a, a gun. Right, in, right, now, right, now in the state of, right now in the state of Illinois, if you are a felon, you will you cannot legally own a gun if you're a felon. So a law-abiding citizen would be somebody who's not a, a, a convicted felon. Anyway. So a yeah. misdemeanor would not prevent you? No, no. We got a question. Um, yes, I would like to ask Ms. Horton a question, but first I'd like to make a statement for Mr. McDonald. Um, I'm the Peoria area Tea Party uh, director for our area, and I just want you to know that you're a hero to us. Um, we are all about the Constitution. That's all we've ever been about. And I just want to thank you for having that courage that you have had. Um, sometimes we have to uh, step up and get jeered at and accused of things that aren't true to do what we do. So I just want to tell you, you are a hero to us, and thank you so much for coming here. Um, my question for Ms. Gordon is, um, what, where are we with the concealed carry in the legislature? How many um, do we have that we know are for? How many do you know? What's the battle? Where are we? What is the status? Right now, I don't think it's a, it's a priority just simply because we have a lot of other issues on the table right now. Um, we're dealing with pension issues, Medicaid issues, budget issues. So right now, it's going nowhere, if, if you ask me. But I'm not, in, I'm not in leadership, so I don't determine what's on the docket, but I would say, I would say that um, I haven't heard anything afoot, but if um, Mr. Coy Pugh, who um, helped uh, helped us to bring Mr. McDowell here today, may have another, may have a, a differing opinion. 